Well, praise the Lord. Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, would you stand with us? We're going to start off with our uh, scripture reading this evening, coming from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Let's all read these together. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Amen. So you greet those around you. Make sure everyone uh, feels welcome. If you didn't get to shake a hand or whatever greeting you want to give, you start to do that, and we're going to start to sing. Go tell it on the mountain. Pueden saludarse unos a otros y vamos a cantar. Pedirle las montañas también. Go tell it on the mountain. Christ is born while shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills, and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains. Don't go now, but you can go later and tell it on the mountain. All right, we three kings of Orient are. Guide us to 
thy perfect life. Frankincense to offer heaven. Yes, and songs a deity nigh. Prayer and praising, come and raising, worshiping God on high. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Mary's mind, it's bitter perfume, brings the light of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, still in the stone cold tomb. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect life. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God in sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, unto heaven replies. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Amen. You may be seated. When I first came, I thought it was capable for the task. There were so many different things that I had to die to and realize I have no power to do these things. I'm just asking God to do for them what I cannot do. Show yourself to your people. Show up. We wanted to go to where there was lostness, northern Mozambican coast. The centuries of Islam that were there, witchcraft. My first thought is, what have I done? How am I going to be affected? This is the beginning of a battle. We came in 2004. With my one-year-old firstborn. All of our kids come and minister together with us. Children open the door to build those relationships with the women, how to share their faith, how to reach out to their families, where it was much more close to the gospel. But there is a sacrifice involved. Witchcraft in this culture is what sustains their life. Who you marry, your health, whether or not you catch fish. Infant mortality rate is high. They live in fear of something happening to their children. When people come to Christ, for them it is a life and death decision. Is this worth my life? Adelina was a very well-known wish doctor. After about a year and a half, we're getting ready to pray, and Adelina just says, I want to get rid of my witchcraft and take down the wish doctor hut. So Sunday afternoon, after church. When that wall fell down, it was just a complete release to God. I no longer need to be afraid of these things. Our work in the local village has spread across the bay through the influence of, of family members. They had made professions of faith. We're starting to see national believers go out as missionaries through persecution, through hard times. God has galvanized their faith far beyond anything that I could teach. Be still and know that I'm God. Adelina starts telling her story about how she has new life in Christ.
God has been faithful to show himself in ways that I never would have expected him to show himself. It's only the work of the Holy Spirit. That tide is turning and momentum is building that God's kingdom is coming to this coastline. Well, hello, Northern Heights. Merry Christmas. So glad you're with us tonight. A special welcome to our visitors and hope you have a great time worshiping Jesus. The uh, video that we just saw is for Lottie Moon, which is the missionary branch of the Southern Baptist Church. And what we're doing as a church is helping to chip in and raise funds to support these dear missionaries that are across the world. In the pocket that is in front of you, you'll see a giving envelope if you're interested in participating in that. We're about halfway to our goal, and we would love to make up some ground on that tonight. If you uh, are willing to give a donation, put it in the envelope, and there are some offering boxes in the entryway on each wall. So feel free to do that. So it's Christmas Eve, and there's three things that I wrote down that I really like about Christmas. So the first one is family. It's great to, to be able to spend time together with family, and I realize not every person maybe has family tonight, but the cool thing is, is that with Jesus, we can be part of God's family. So family is a very important thing to God. Second of all, I love lights. It's fun to put lights up outside the house, inside the house, all over the place. But you know what? That's a representation of Jesus being the light of the world. And we can rejoice as we see all these Christmas lights that he is the light of the world. Finally, giving gifts and receiving gifts. That's kind of fun. Is anybody excited about doing that? Yes, of course. But you know what? We were given the greatest gift in history when God the Father decided to send his son to this earth. So that is the reason we give gifts and receive gifts. So it's really fun to be able to celebrate that and remember throughout this whole time of Christmas that that's the reason we're doing this. What I'd like to do is just uh, pray together and give this night to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to celebrate the coming of Jesus. Thank you for the incredible gift that he is. He is the light of the world. And if we call on him and make him our Lord, we're part of the family. So thank you that we can celebrate all three of those things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Sabes que tu hijo Jesús es el hijo de Dios María sabes que tu hijo Jesús sanará todo dolor Sabes que tu hijo Jesús del cielo descendió está en tus brazos es nuestro salvador oh, Mary did you know Stand and join us as we sing Away in a Manger. I 
I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet the songs repeat Of peace on earth, goodwill to men And the bells are ringing Like a choir they're singing In the heart I hear them Peace on earth, goodwill despair I bowed my head There is no peace on earth I say For hate is strong and marks the song <clears throat> Of peace on earth goodwill to men But the best are ringing like a choir singing does anybody hear them peace on earth good will to me bells more loud and deep God is not dead nor does he sleep the wrong shall fail the right prevail with peace on earth good will to man then ringing singing on it Evolve from light to day. A voice to chime, a chance to blind. A peace on earth, goodwill to man. And the bells that ring like a choir. Singing. And with our hearts we'll hear them Peace on earth, goodwill to man Do you hear the bells that ring in? The light the angels singing Christmas Northern Heights. 
And it's great to see everybody. And on behalf of our family to you, we just hope you have an incredible time this Christmas uh, celebrating an incredible Savior. And I was telling the 430 crowd earlier, it's just so fantastic to see a, a church back in action and a church that's not intimidated by the news that's going on in our world right now as we're worshiping, but a church that's dedicated to the worship of a holy God. And I just want to commend this church for your perseverance in light of everything that's, that's happening in our world. And, and, and again, our family just wishes you guys the best Christmas. We love you guys and uh, love celebrating Christmas. We also want to welcome our Spanish ministry here tonight and so thankful that we're one church and that many from our Spanish ministry could be here tonight. And so just take some time before you leave just to welcome them and, and we'll welcome each other and, and just enjoy the great church that God continues to build right here in Norfolk. I want to invite you to open up your copy of God's Word if you brought a copy to Isaiah chapter 9. And as a church, we've been looking at this one verse for the past few weeks. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And so if you've got a copy of God's Word, just open up. Most of the verses that we're looking at tonight are going to be on the screen. The song that you just heard John and Julie sing was written by a guy by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He was one of America's most well-known poets during the 1860s and before. He was one of the greatest poets, actually, that America's ever produced. And at the same time, he was a guy who understood tragedy. older because he hated the scars on his face he decided to live the rest of his life with a beard he knew he was a man who knew sorrow he was a man who knew tribulation in 1865 his oldest son enlisted in the civil war without his permission and was severely injured with an injury that sustained his entire life he never got over it so Longfellow is a man who understands tragedy. In fact, it's the backdrop of those tragedies that he wrote this song that you just heard, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And you can sort of sense his anguish in the words of the song when one lyric reads this. And in despair, as he thought about all the trials that he went through, and in despair I bowed. accustomed to that, bad news every day, tragedy, fear-mongering going on over time in this world that we live, news of one variant entering the nation and another variant is around the corner and we're constantly bombarded with these messages and sometimes trouble just shows up and it shatters peace. We're all accustomed to that. We all know that. The world definitely isn't experiencing peace tonight. Did you know that as we worship here tonight, there are more than 260,000 Russian soldiers that have amassed at the Ukrainian border waiting to move in as we're worshiping right here tonight? The world doesn't know peace. Two days ago, the United States and Japan entered into a contingency contract expecting an impending invasion by China of Taiwan at any moment. This world doesn't know peace. There is no peace, and I think this world could relate to what Longfellow said here. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth. Protests are erupting all around the world. 
You look at the Netherlands and Belgium. You, you look in Australia and Italy and Croatia and even places in the United States all because of COVID mandates. The world's definitely not at peace. In fact, there's an interesting study that's done every year called the Global Peace Index. And somehow, and I don't know how statisticians do it, but somehow they're able to measure peace. And it found that in 2021, peace dropped globally by a percentage of 0.07%. And you might think, well, that's no big deal, 0.07%. 0.07, that's not that big of a degree. But when you realize that in the last 13 years, there have been nine years when the global peace index has dropped dramatically, then you begin to realize that peace in the world is an elusive commodity. And the reality is, church, when you think about peace in the world, the reality is that the Bible teaches that the world on this side of Christ's return will never know true peace. Do you know that? The Bible teaches that on this side of Jesus Christ's return, the world in general will never know true peace. This is a troubled world. And this world, according to what the Bible teaches, is spiraling towards a final climatic judgment. And every day it gets a sense of that. And every day this world gets a taste of what's coming I was studying Isaiah and Ezekiel these past few months, and there was one passage in Isaiah that stood out to me in my personal quiet time. In Isaiah 26, or rather Isaiah 13, God has a great reminder in here about that impending climatic judgment. Listen to these words. Listen to what the world is dealing with. Verse 6, well for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty, it will come. And therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They'll be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them, and they will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They'll look aghast at one another. Their face will be aflame. This is what is coming for the world. This is what they experience every day. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. And then God says in verse 11, And I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. So God's sovereign judgment is coming to the world. And we might say to ourselves, well, I thought God was patient. He, he is. And we might say, well, I thought God is a God of love. He is. And you might be thinking to yourself, I thought God was a God of mercy, and he is, and God is a God of salvation. But ladies and gentlemen, understand that the Bible says that his patience will not continue forever, and a day of wrath is coming for the world. That's what this world is hurling towards. And so when you look at that perspective, and we're going someplace with this, when you look at that perspective and what the world at large and what the scene is, understand something. There's no utopia coming for the world this side of Christ's return. There's no utopia coming. There's no UN grand, UN grand global scheme of peace that will work. And we know this as Christians. We, we know it. We see it. This is not a surprise. It's hard to hear. But this is the fate of the world every day. So how's that for a Christmas Eve sermon introduction <laughs> but I share that with you because I want to encourage you tonight with something I want to encourage you with this I want to I want to encourage you as Christians to stop chasing what the world defines as peace to stop pursuing the world's idea of peace a false peace but instead I want to encourage you to pursue a real peace a true peace, a radical peace. There is a genuine peace that's offered to the world. But this peace is not, a, is not a social construct. This peace that's offered to the world is not something that's manufactured by a great group of philosophers or a great governmental organization. This peace that is offered to the world is not something that some scientist can manifest or manufacture or some political party can put out there for the world. This peace that is offered for the world is a peace that has to be individually received. And the good news is tonight, there is a peace that is offered to the world that any man, woman, boy, and girl can receive in spite of what's happening in our world. The peace that I'm talking about with you tonight is provided in only one person. 
And we find him in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And hopefully you have your Bible open to Isaiah 9. Now I want you to take a look at this verse and the peace that is offered to the world. You see it there in Isaiah 9, 6? And by the way, before we read it, understand the timing of this verse is crucially important. This verse was written at a time of 750 B.C. And on Sunday mornings we've been studying that as a church. And 750 B.C. in the nation of Israel was a very dark time for that nation because of their rebellion against God. And this nation was on the brink of collapse. And in just three years from when this verse was given that we're going to read in a moment, in just three years from the moment this verse was given, this nation, Israel, would be decimated and God's divine judgment would absolutely crush them. You get the picture? And so it was a time of hopelessness, much like we're experiencing in our world today. It was a time of despondency. Isaiah 9, 6 comes from a time when people were disillusioned and shocked and they had a sense of hopelessness. Do you know they did a survey of hope? I, and again, I don't know how statisticians measure hope in the world, but do you know that they found that about 7 out of 10 people have absolutely no hope today? Can you imagine living in existence we have absolutely no hope. That's Isaiah 9, 6. But in the middle of this dark period of history in 750 BC, I want you to imagine that, that as we read Isaiah 9, 6 in a moment, it's like a window that opens up from heaven. And Isaiah 9, 6 gets a, gives us a close-up perspective of the heart of God like no other verse in the Bible. In fact, a lot of Bible scholars believe that Isaiah 9, 6 is the greatest prophetic statement found in the entire Bible. It is a message of peace. It is a message for the world. It is a message that encapsulates the heart of Christmas. It's a message about a birth of a baby. But this baby is very different. It's a baby with four names. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's read it together. I'll read it. You read it out loud with me. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You pray with me as we dive into this incredible passage. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these names that we've had the opportunity to examine the last few weeks. And Lord, I, I pray that we wouldn't move by them too quickly. But at each opportunity, at each name, Lord, you would write that name on our hearts and our mind. You would show us how you're the wonderful counselor. Lord, you would prove to us how you're the mighty God how you are the everlasting Father. And Lord, tonight we want to see in a world that doesn't know peace, how you are one who offers peace individually to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Lord, help us as Christians to know this Prince of Peace in our lives, to be able to experience this kind of peace, even when the world is in total chaos and despair. We thank you for our time of worship. We thank you for this incredible moment in our calendar and Christmas and Lord we know that we have an incredible Savior. We give you great praise and great honor Lord and it's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen. And by the way remember last Sunday and a couple Sundays ago we began to challenge anybody who is in sixth grade and below if you memorize this verse next Sunday we're going to have a prize table out in the foyer and if you're able to quote this verse with one or two hints you're going to get something from that prize table just because we believe that this is one of the most important verses to put in our minds. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We've looked at the first three names in the last few weeks. Tonight we're going to take up the fourth name, prince of peace, and we're really going to look at it just from two different angles. And we're really just going to ask really two very simple questions. Question number one is, how is Jesus a prince Prince of Peace. And question number two is, how is Jesus peace? So let's think about this first question and this first angle. How is Jesus a prince? You might want to circle the word prince. It doesn't refer to the artist formerly known as prince, right? But it is a designation for Jesus Christ. And the Hebrew word for prince here is really interesting. It's spelled S-A-R and it's pronounced sayer. And, and it has three meanings in Isaiah's time. It had at least three meanings. 
The first meaning included a literal meaning, and it literally means prince or captain or governor or ruler. And I, and I think we, we can understand that name, captain, ruler, prince, leader. A second meaning literally describes this, one who rules, reigns, or holds dominion over something. And so a prince was somebody in Isaiah's time, and even afterwards, who was a young man who would one day come from a royal throne, who would one day have dominion over a kingdom. And so when Isaiah introduces us to this Prince of Peace, he's describing somebody, and in this case, he's describing Jesus Christ, who would one day rule over a kingdom, right? And he would have total dominion over the kingdom. The kingdom of this world would be his reign. But in Isaiah's day, there's a third additional meaning that is really interesting. And this third additional meaning, I really want you to let it to sink in into your mind. And here it is, this third meaning. This word prince, thirdly, refers to someone who is the sole owner or controller of something. Someone who's the control owner or controller of something. For instance, in Isaiah's day, if you were the commander of an army, you're oftentimes referred to as a prince. And so a, a, a commander of an army, they, would, they wouldn't call commander, but they would call him prince. If you were a dad and you had uh, one children or more in the home of Isaiah's day, you were called a prince. Now, dads, you might want to go home tonight. You might want to institute that in your home. No longer will you call me dad. From now on, you will call me prince, right? This is, but this is what they did in Isaiah's day. And so when Isaiah calls Jesus the prince of peace, he's saying not only is Jesus the ruler, not only is Jesus a captain, not only is one day is he going to have dominion over the kingdom of this world, but Jesus is the owner and the keeper and the master of peace. So how is Jesus the owner of peace? Well, all you have to do is look at the life of Jesus. And you find this aspect of master of peace all throughout Jesus' ministry, don't you? I mean, think about all the interactions Jesus had with people, everything that Jesus said, all the miracles ha ha that he performed, and how he embodies this idea in this name of being Prince of Peace. Think about the life of Christ for a moment. In Luke 4, when there was a crowd that became so angry at Jesus that they wanted to throw him off of a cliff, the Bible says that Jesus just simply peacefully walked right through them. In Luke 8, while on a boat, in the middle of a storm, the disciples were terrified in the storm, thinking their ship was going to sink. What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping <laughs> peacefully, right? He embodies this idea of being Prince of Peace. In John chapter 6, when the disciples were flustered that they had a huge crowd to feed, and the Bible says 5,000, but we know with men, women, and children, there were probably more than 25,000. They were flustered, thinking to themselves, how in the world are we going to feed all this mass of people? And Jesus simply peacefully gave the command, give them something to eat. And Jesus provided. In John 11, when Jesus learned the news that his good friend Lazarus had passed away and died, and, and the whole community was wailing in grief, do you remember what Jesus did? Do you remember what he said? He told that crowd peacefully, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me will never die. In John chapter 14, moments before Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples were in the upper room. They were filled with fear and panic. Do you remember what Jesus said at that moment? Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And at the very moment of his crucifixion, I think we see this embodiment of being the Prince of Peace the most because at the very moment of his crucifixion, when Jesus was dying on the cross and the crowd was hurling insults at him, do you remember what he prayed in total peace before the Father? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I don't know about you, but when I think about the ministry of Jesus and the life of Jesus and how he embodied peace, I think to myself, I need that peace. <laughs> I need the kind of peace that Jesus had in order to get through a world of storms and loss and even the crisis of death. And Jesus demonstrated to us what true peace is. He demonstra demonstrated to us what this definition of the word peace in Isaiah 9, 6. Look again at Isaiah 9, 6. You might want to circle the word peace. It comes from the Hebrew word shalom. You may have heard that word. It's a personal peace. It means completeness, 
or wholeness. Anybody need that tonight? Anybody need completeness in their mind? Wholeness in, your, in their mind? This biblical word shalom isn't the idea of absence from trouble. It's not the idea that uh, there's absence of war is the only way that you can have peace. But no, this shalom peace, this biblical peace has nothing to do with what's going on around you or outside of you. But it has everything to do with the condition on the inside of you. That's shalom. And so understand as you look at this word shalom, it has nothing to do with what's going on in the world, but it has everything that's to do with what's going on right here in a person's heart. And in other words, like Jesus, a person can be at total and complete peace no matter what news they hear. A person can be at total, it is possible for a person to be at total, complete peace no matter what circumstances they're dealing with, no matter what's going on in the world. And we find this word shalom all throughout the Bible. It's mentioned more than 200 times. For example, in Isaiah 26, 3, we read these words, that you keep him in perfect peace, there's that word shalom, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In Isaiah 32, verse 17, we find the word again, and it says, in the effect of righteousness will be peace, shalom, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. And so, folks, we've got to understand that whatever else the world calls peace, it's just an illusion. The world thinks that peace comes from the outside in. You know what the Bible teaches? Real peace comes from the inside out. That's why biblical peace is so different than anything that the world has to offer. Jesus' peace, think about this, didn't come from his ability to change his circumstances. Jesus rarely ever changed his circumstances, he just dealt with it. Jesus' peace didn't come from him changing his circumstances. Jesus' peace didn't come from him thinking positively about what's going on in the world and he was at Lazarus' tomb and just thinking positively. That's not what happened here. Jesus' peace didn't come from centering himself. Has anybody ever given you that advice? You just got to center yourself. I don't even know what that means when people tell me that. I got to center myself. Jesus' peace didn't come from centering himself. Do you know where Jesus' peace came from? It came from trust in his Father. It came from knowing that his Father was absolutely sovereign over this world. It came from a trust knowing that God's providence cannot be thwarted in this world. That's where Jesus' peace came from. That gave him peace. And this real peace belongs exclusively to the baby in the manger who rules and masters over it but he gives it individually to people. And that brings us to the second point here, that Jesus is peace. We've already looked at how Jesus is a prince. Now I want you to notice how Jesus is peace. And there's a catch to understanding this, that you can never experience the peace of Jesus until you first have experienced the peace with God. You catch that? You can't have this peace that we've described of Jesus in Luke 4 and Luke 8 and in John 6 and John 11 and so many other instances in the Bible until you first have peace with God. And I want us to think about for the next few minutes, what does it mean to have peace with God? Do you know that there's a virus out there? And I want to help you understand what does it mean to have peace with God? But did you know that there's a virus out there that's more lethal than COVID? And something that every human being should fear more than COVID? (laughs) There's a virus out there that's absolutely lethal and deadly to every human being. There's a virus out there that has infected every human being. Do you know what it is? It's sin. And sin has infected every human being who has ever been born. And the Bible teaches us that as human beings, we all lack peace with God because of sin's infection in our lives. Think about some of these verses, and you cruise through the New Testament, and you find that the Bible teaches this over and over again, because this is humanity's number one problem. In Romans 3, we find that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, we learn that the wages of sin is death. In other words, sin's price is eternal punishment punishment in hell for every person who's ever been born because sin is an offense against a holy God. You look at Romans 5:10 and you find that the entirety of the human race is an enemy of God because of sin. Do you know who you were before Christ came into your life? The Bible says you're an enemy. 
Why? Because of sin. You go on in Ephesians 2 and you learn that we were dead before Christ. We were depraved. We were all infected. We've all inherited that same sinful DNA. This is the common denominator for every human being. This is the bad news. We're all infected. But at the cross of Jesus Christ, at the cross of the Prince of Peace, something amazing happened. Listen to Colossians 1.20. It says, and through him, the apostle Paul wrote, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Think about that for a moment. Peace always comes at a price. If you've ever served in the military, you know that. If you have an appreciation for the history of the United States, you know that. That the freedom that we enjoy here has come at a very heavy price. Peace always comes at an enormous price, and that's never more true than when we see the cross of Christ. Colossians goes on to say, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. That's, who you, that's a before picture. That's who you were before Christ. You see how the Bible describes you? You were alienated. You were hostile in mind. You were doing evil deeds. That's who you were before Christ. For some who don't know Christ in this room, this is who you are right now. Colossians 1 goes on and says that Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That word reconcile is an incredible word. That word reconcile represents the deepest need of every human being, whether they can articulate it or not, that the world understands and the lost world understands that a reconciliation has to take place. It means to bring us together. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to share with you tonight, you've looked at the bad news, but here's the good news, that Jesus Christ has provided a way that we can be brought back together to the God who created us. We can have peace. And that's the glory of Christmas, right? This is the theology of Bethlehem. This is the theology of that little manger scene that we've become so accustomed to. What happened at Bethlehem? What is the theology of Bethlehem? Well, the Prince of Peace, who is God, became flesh and entered into our world, and he lived a sinless, perfect life. He lived a sinless, perfect life, and he died on a cruel cross, and he took the punishment that should have been given to me and to you and to every human being, and he took it upon himself, absorbing the wrath of God that belonged to you, satisfying the demands of a holy God. And three days later, he rose from the dead, proving his victory. And ladies and gentlemen, when we receive the Prince of Peace in our life, we're no longer enemies of God. This is the good news of Christmas, right? This is why we celebrate Christmas today. When we receive Jesus Christ, we're no longer at war with God, but we're at peace with him. This is what Romans 5.1 describes. Listen to this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Did you hear that? We have peace with God. How do we have peace with God? Because we've been justified by faith. What does the word justified mean? It means to be made right. It means to be made whole. It means to be made right with God. How do we receive this justification? Look at what the verse says. If it's on the screen, let's look what it says. Therefore, having been justified by what? Not by good deeds. Not by faith, or, or by faith, not by tradition, but by faith. Not by works, but by what? By faith, not by rituals, not by baptism, not by taking the Lord's Supper, not by coming to church, but by faith. That's how we receive justification and, and are made right with God. And, and that very moment, church, our entire identity changes when, when, when we become a child of God, our, our entire identity changes the moment we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're forgiven. We're chosen. We're prized. Do you know other words that the Bible uses to describe our identity in Christ? We're redeemed. We're adopted into a family. We're friend of God, not an enemy. The Bible describes our identity like this. You've been reconciled. You're no longer separated. 
You're free instead of being enslaved. You're regenerated and you're not dead. You are made alive. This is what Jesus Christ does. This is why the Prince of Peace came. That's the peace God offers for everybody. How do you receive it? By faith. What is faith? Faith is repentance and belief. Two sides of the same coin. I come to the Lord. Repentance means a change of mind and a change of direction. I recognize the direction that I've been going. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I turn 180 degrees. Instead of living life my own way, I now surrender to Jesus Christ. And I believe that he's the son of God, God the son, and he rose from the dead after he died in my place. I mean, there's no other message like this in all the world. This is what our world needs today. This is what every person needs. This is what a hungry world is longing for today. This is why you see so much misery in the news Because people need this. This is what the angels meant. When they gathered together in that angelic chorus, in that first Christmas, in Luke 2.14, they declared glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And folks, once you have the peace with God, once you know God and God knows you, then you know what happens? Then you can have peace the peace of God. But you can't get the cart before the horse, right? Once you're connected to your creator, then you can have the peace of God. What does the peace of God look like? One of the greatest statements Jesus ever made about peace is John 14, 27, when he said this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. You see that, that generic peace? Jesus said, I don't give peace like the world gives. It's a phony peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. It's interesting that Jesus said that statement, that verse, moments before he was going to be crucified. And so moments before he was going to be crucified, he said, peace I leave you. Not as the world gives do I give. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And so Jesus showed us again that you can have peace in the middle of a storm. Do you know you you can have peace in the middle of a rocky marriage? Did you know that you can have peace in the middle of a dysfunctional family? Do you know that you can have peace when there's all kinds of questions about your job and your future? Do you know that you can have peace no matter what is going on in our world and no matter what those so-called experts tell you is coming around the corner, you can still have peace in the middle of a storm? The Apostle Paul echoed the same idea in Philippians 4, 6. Listen to this. Don't be anxious about anything, the Apostle Paul said. In other words, don't worry about anything. Talking to the believer But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then in verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7 one more time. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that verse? Uh, don't, don't, don't nod your head too quickly, right? Do you believe that? Is that how you're living? Uh, church, understand, you can have peace no matter what is happening in the world. But peace requires trust, doesn't it? It requires trust in the one who came to be the Prince of Peace. Listen, you can have peace in the middle of a difficult circumstance because you know that Jesus is the all-powerful one. And who is the answer to your greatest need? You can have strength and confidence in the middle of family drama and job stress and and office politics because you know that God is the all-wise God and he's in absolute total sovereign control. You can have hope in the middle of a health crisis because you know that the Prince of Peace lives inside of you. You can face the world seen today and all of its misery with joy and contentment because you know that the Prince of Peace lives and you know that the Prince of Peace reigns. Church, do you understand the reality of Christ in you? Do you know the reality of Christ in you this Christmas? Because when you do and you begin to surrender all the areas of your life that are causing you fear, and by the way, do you know 
have you ever realized that those things that we fear the most and worry the most about and stressed out about the most are the very things that we've yet to surrender to the Lord? And when you surrender those things to the Lord, the apostle Paul says, there will be a peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard your heart and your mind. I mean, that's the hope of Christmas. I wonder, I wonder if there's anything, when I asked the earlier crowd at 4.30 this question, I just want you to process it for a minute. Is there anything that's robbing you of peace tonight, right now? What is the definition of completeness? Is there anything that's robbing you of completeness and wholeness? What is it? It's probably something that you've yet surrendered to the Lord. Man, it could be a church thing. It could be a family thing. It could be a, a world thing. It, it could be a job thing. What is it that's robbing you of peace today? Don't let it rob you any longer. Because the Prince of Peace has come to give you the peace of God. Thirdly, I, I want to close with this challenge. And thirdly, it's to be fortified by God's word. There are a lot of reasons to read the Bible. We could go talk all night about reasons to read the Bible. But one of them is that God gives us peace through his word. And I want to share with you a couple of verses. And, and then I want to offer you a challenge that we do every year at church. Jesus said something really interesting in the Gospel of John. He said, I have said these things. And he's talking about the entirety of the Gospel. I said everything that I've said. I've, I've taught everything that I've taught to you. That in me, you may have peace. And in the world, you're going to have tribulation. And we know that. We've experienced it. Some of you are experiencing it right now. Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but take heart. Because I've overcome the world. In Psalm 119, 165, it says this. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Great peace people have. Those people who know your law, know your word. And nothing can rob them of peace. You see, God's word will fortify your faith. God's word will be an anchor in the storm. His word is that valuable possession because it's God's only message that was ever written to mankind. And when you read it, when you hear it, when you live it, when you absorb it, when you obey it, when you live it out, your life is radically strengthened. Every year, I, I give a, the church a challenge, and we provide reading guides for you just different ways to absorb the Bible. Some of them are Old and New Testament reading guides. Some of them are just New Testament. Some of them are just Bible reading guides that have special places in God's Word. But those reading guides are available at, in, on, on the Connect desk in the foyer. And I want to challenge you to pick it up. Because church, if you want to know real peace, it cannot come without regular absorption of God's Word. And so grab one of those guides on the way out and live it and obey it. And believe it, and your life will be radically strengthened. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. We thank you so much for your love this Christmas as we think about all the happenings that are going on. And, and as Gene reminded us, there are so many reasons to look at Christmas as the most wonderful time of the year. Lord, the greatest reason is that gift that you've given us in the Prince of Peace. Lord, I pray for the people in this room who may not know you as Prince of Peace. They've never experienced peace with God. Lord, I pray that you'd open their eyes and their ears to your truth, to your love for them. You would quicken them and make them alive. Lord, I pray for us as believers who know you. Lord, this world can be a very worrisome place. And Father, there's so many things that are pulling at us that can rob us of the peace that ought to be rightfully ours. Father, I pray that you would encourage this church. You would strengthen them in the days that we're living. You would embolden them and empower them. Lord, you would impress on them the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, your peace would guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you for the greatest gift of all. We thank you for the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and ultimately the Prince of Peace in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, tonight we have the privilege of celebrating and remembering the Lord's Supper. And if you'd like to participate with us, 
If you're a follower of Christ and a believer in Christ and there's been a time in your life when you've submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we, we want you to know that this is an open Lord's Supper. And so regardless of where your church membership is, we'd love for you to participate with us if that's something you want to do. So coming in, if you didn't grab a Lord's Supper um, communion set and you'd like to do that with us, if you just lift your hand and one of our ushers will get one to you. Just lift it kind of high so we can make sure that everybody who wants to participate can do that. Right. You know, the Bible tells us that before we take the Lord's Supper, we examine our hearts. We just have a time where we get, uh, get alone before the Lord. We ask God to evaluate our life. And the, the question we need to ask as we pray silently in a moment, Lord, is there anything in my life that doesn't measure up to the fullness of Christ? And Father, if there is, you'd show me so I can give that to you and confess it to you. And, and Lord, you change me. So let's just move into a moment of silent prayer And I'll close our time in prayer. But you evaluate your heart and ask God's Holy Spirit just to show you things in your life, conviction of things that need to be made right with him. Let's pray. Father, you're so, so good. Lord, we don't want there to be anything in our lives that's distracting us from living in fullness of Christ. But Lord, we know that as we travail through this world, we know that there are things in our lives that oftentimes don't measure up. A habit, a thought, a deed, a word. Lord, sometimes we wrestle with things and we totally forget about them. But Lord, if there are things in our lives that don't measure up to your glory, Lord, would you show those to us? Would you convict us? Lord, help us to be a people who are constantly confessing and repenting so that we can be made more and more into the image of Christ. And Lord, you would use this time and this conviction to disciple us to be more like you. We thank you for your immediate forgiveness. We thank you for your total forgiveness, your merciful, unconditional forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. If you would, just take... And gently peel back the top plastic sleeve that reveals the bread. And remember this bread that you're holding in your hand is a representation and a memorial. Just a memorial, but an important memorial. That memorializes the body of Jesus Christ. It reminds us that it was his body that gave you life. It reminds us that his body was treated so cruelly so that you could have eternal life in heaven. And so let's eat this together and remember, remember what Christ did for us. You pull back the second sleeve carefully and reveal in the juice. And and again, this juice, like the bread, is a reminder. It's a memorial. It's a memorial and a reminder of the precious blood of Christ and how much God loves you and he loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And anybody who would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. So as you drink this, remember the precious blood of Christ that was spilled on your behalf. You drink and remember. All right, we have some candle lighters that are going to be coming down the aisles to light your candle. If you find one close to you there, they'll get those lit as we watch this video.
carefully stand with your lit candle, and we will sing three verses of Silent Night. All right, let's sing it. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and wild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night, darkness flies, all is light, shepherds hear the angels sing. Alleluia, hail the King. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night. Holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Merry Christmas again to you and your family. You can blow those out as you uh, desire. And there'll be baskets at the back. If you uh, just take your blown out candle with you towards the door and you can put those in the basket, if you would. Let me uh, pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together to, to um, just to sing praises to you and to, to worship you, to remember that uh, uh, you came to earth as a babe. You didn't start as a baby, though. You started in the beginning. And uh, so we just thank you for, for doing that, for living a perfect life, giving us an example how we should live, and for going to that uh, cruel cross and uh, bearing our sins uh, and forgiving us of our sins. So we love you so much. Thank you that you love us more. Uh, go with us. Bless our uh, times together uh, this Christmas. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.